All right, take two, one for copying. Yes, more paper again. <clears throat> I'm turning these over to my next slide and still, still be out of order. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's work with the main worksheet first, and I'll just try to explain what's going on. Which one's the main one? This one. Okay. <laughs> it's very similar, and it's parallel to what we did with the aspect worksheet. In fact, it's based on the aspect worksheet, because it continues from where the other left off. It continues number 13 in the aspect worksheet, if you remember, is where we had the final listing of all of the planets and, uh, ooh. Uh, all right, here we are. This is the uh, Jay Gould, you all have one of these already. This is the the first stages, the first 13 steps. <coughs> and in the first 13 steps, we accomplished the first objective. And that first objective was to get the relative strength of each of the aspects. And we gave them a uh, each a numerical strength, and we looked at the percentage of each. Now we're going to try to do the same thing with planets. And so what we do, number 14, if you look on the back side, you enter all of the aspects from the aspect worksheet. You take and put them in the box for each planet. And then under each aspect, you put its strength. On the back, uh, it, should, it tells you exactly how to do that. Are you going to be able to email these forms to us too? Yeah, I just <laughs> I haven't gotten around. I've been kind of slow about that. And then steps 15 and step 16 are carryovers from this worksheet, the second one that you have tonight. And what they do is they look at many, many things some planet-oriented and some sign-oriented that add up to other strengths of a planet. Now, the important thing to, rep to remember when we're doing all of this is that uh, this is all based, the primary determining factor in all of this is aspects. And all of the other modifications <coughs> that come from this worksheet are going to be some major and some minor modifications of uh, aspect totals. Richard, there's um, FYI that number 13 on Google, I think, should be number 12. Oh, okay. Uh, on the back of a, yeah, exactly. Oh, okay. All right. Moon, yes. Yes, should be number 12. Good. So the, the 1 plus, it should be 1 plus 12 plus 16. Yes. All right, let's take and do the Gould chart together, and uh, we'll go through all of the uh, all of all of the things for the Gould chart. Take only one of these, and one of those.
I need one of the uh, groove main. Okay. No, I got the second. All right. I hope everybody bought their, their groove material along from earlier times. That's it. That's enough right there. Aspect worksheet. All right. Let's look at step 14. We'll just look at the first few for an example. The sun forms only two aspects, the third strongest aspect and the um, sixth strongest aspect. And if we look on the chart, it's 90 for the, the sun trine Jupiter and 63 for the sun trine Uranus. That's where we get, that's where we get the numbers from. What we're saying is in this step is that the primary component is all of the aspects that each planet makes. Venus has the strongest aspect. Obviously, that carries over. And it has number 9, which has only a 27. And it has number 15, which is only 13. So even though... Venus has three aspects and also has the strongest aspect. Its total is not as strong as the sun. The biggest total, as you can see, is Saturn. Saturn has four aspects and two of them are quite appreciable. So in effect, what statement 14 says, <laughs> just by looking at the Gould chart, is that if a planet has two or three pretty strong aspects, that makes that planet a contender for being a life ruler. That's the statement. The number of aspects, especially the number of strong aspects, determines whether the planet is more or less likely to be the life ruler. Now, if you want, you could take the foreshortened version and just take and say you're done with step 14. But I would be less likely to do that than to quit at uh, step 4 in the aspect worksheet. Because the modifications in the planet worksheet can be much more substantial than they are in the uh, aspect worksheet. Because there are more of them, and some of them are quite significant, like especially rulership of the ascendant. Because rulership of the ascendant is as strong as, uh, as a, as an, as a average or better aspect. So it's like having another aspect when you have ruler of the ascendant. And yet you don't really show that in the address. Oh, yes. Yeah. Now we, let's, yeah. let's do that now. Let's, uh, let's look at, uh, the, number 15 says the, uh, let's look at the planet sign considerations for 15, which is on the bottom of this page. Let's look at those first. So, again, this is up to you and your interpretations. I'm still disinclined to make tables, very much disinclined, because I don't want to take away from anybody's freedom of estimation, and I don't want to set myself up as a Gestapo authority astrologer. <laughs> it's just not my... <laughs> I will follow willingly. That's <laughs> All right. Let's look at AA. Let's go down the column for AA under planet sign considerations. And that says add or subtract up to 15, plus 15 or minus 15. 
uh, as to how a sign, uh, planet agrees with the sign that it is in. And the really high numbers should be for rulerships in positive, in detriment, in negative, and exaltation should be somewhere up there but not as high as rulership, and fall should be somewhere low but not as low as, uh, as detriment. Now this is something that varies from astrologer to astrologer, uh, and most of the people who argue for the uh, exaltation talk in the way you are in their watch. Yeah, I the stay a little high. Quite a bit. Yeah, all right, I'll move the game back a little bit. Oh, oh, yeah. It's still going to go somewhat in here. That's that's better. As long as it's fine, it yeah. okay. Now there are people who claim that exaltation is stronger than rulership, and I say that's baloney, because the whole foundation of astrology is based on rulership. When you look at a house that's empty and you want to understand that house, you don't look for the planet that that's exalted on the cusp. You look for the planet that rules on the cusp. And obviously that has to be the strongest relationship because that's how it works astrologically. We have several thousand years of records and astrologers working and they've come to that conclusion. Yes, it works that way. So it's beyond me how people can claim that they, I think they hear the word exaltation and they think that it's super strong there. And if it is super strong there, then that should, what, what should be the planet that rules the house? Yeah, go ahead. I was going to say, though, in that uh, original astrology book that uh, you gave us from uh, Max Heindel, Max Heindel, he even talks about it in there, that exaltation is... Yeah, I think he made an error. Because he himself, when he rule, when he looks at empty houses, when he, when he wants to see what's happening to them, he looks at the ruler of the cusp and not the exaltation of the cusp. That's what he's supposed to do. That according to what, according to all the history of astrology, that's the so case. So what, what does the exaltation? The exaltation means a special quality comes out. And when that special quality comes out, it comes out very strong. And uh, I don't deny that there is something very intense with an exaltation, but it is not as fundamental as the basic rulership. Okay. Let's look at AA. I give uh, a minus four to the uh, sun being in Gemini. Because basically I don't find uh, Gemini to be a strong place for the sun. Now there is some temptation if you want rough guidelines. In general, the sun likes positive signs and dislikes negative signs. But I don't find Gemini to be, I, I rarely find it to be a strong position for the sun. These are all subjective things. Venus, I give a plus. Uh, Venus is in Cancer. You might even give it a little more because Venus does like uh, Cancer because of the imaginative qualities of it. Then comes Mercury, which gets a full plus 15, which is the maximum, because... That is the sign it rules, and it's its most positive rulership. The moon is in Libra, and that's just a little too airy for the moist moon. Saturn gets a plus 10 because it's exalted. Uh, Jupiter gets a plus 10 because it is exalted. Mars gets a minus 12. I somehow don't like to take really strong negatives, but Mars is in detriment. And so it gets a minus five. Uranus never does well in Pisces because that's the sign of its planetary opposite. And Neptune doesn't do well in Aquarius because that's the sign of its planetary opposite. Pluto is in the sign of its octave, uh, Aries, and so it does all right. All right, everybody follows what we did there. You meant Mars was a minus 12, not a minus five. Minus Mars is a minus 12. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Will you be consistent with these numbers or is it change from chart to chart? Uh, 
usually consistent, but there may, may be some that changes from chart, chart to chart. After a while, you find yourself noticing things and you start getting a feeling that no, after many charts, I'm doing this, uh, I'm not doing this wrong. But you've got to remember here, if you look at, um, if you look at the final totals that we come up with in this, all of the, uh, planets end up somewhere between, uh, 150 and 200, and that means but we're looking at, with most of these things, we're looking at one or two percent. So it's not significant, and you want to, you know, you, you save your, you save your strong evaluation for the significance. So, good question, though. In DB, uh, only one planet is in critical degrees. Uh, I'm more, much more scotch about critical degrees. What the critical degrees are, are where the cusp of the lunar zodiac superimposed on a solar or zodiac where they occur, where the moon moves each day. So they are, for cardinal, first, 13th, no, first, oh my, yes, 13th. And uh, 25th, 6th, 9th, and 21st, and uh, common 4th and 17th. Now note that I have used the uh, ordinal numbers and not cardinal numbers. So first means everything between zero to one. I give an orb on either side, so it would be everything from zero to two on one side, but I do not go into the side sign before. So this would be everything between 12 and 13, which would mean that it would be everything between 11 and 14. Nothing below 11, nothing above 14. So I give actually an orb on either side, a, a, a degree on either side of the exact critical degree. Have you ever, have any of you ever worked with critical degrees before? No, I love the number 12, the number 13. The 13th degree is, is everything between 12 and 13. Right. Right. That's that's the exact degree. Right. But if you allow a degree on either side, it means everything between 11 and 12 is included and everything between 13 and 14 is included. <laughs> what? Because on the first one, because if you're at zero, I didn't want to go into the sign before. In that, I'm very traditional. Uh, I think that in a sign before is not the same thing. We had a knockdown dragon mod argument here Sunday night to somebody who wanted to avoid a fourth son from a previous degree. And it was absolutely disastrous. And you just couldn't understand why 29 Pisces was important. It wasn't the same as one area. Yeah. Uh, that's the problem. No, see, I've studied a lot of um, horary astrology. And for hundreds of years, going back into horary astrology, that's like uh, the East Chain of Astrology. Like for any given moment, you do a horoscope and that you have a question. And um, then you, uh, the answer, the idea is that the question and the answer are in the same moment, and that's a silhouette. And you find it again and again that uh, the influences do not go across borders, at least in horary astrology, which is much more uh, legalistic than any other kind of astrology because uh, in order to pull rabbits out of hats, you have to be very strict about some things. You can't be, you know, a human consciousness, you know, there's an aura uh, of something there are exact thoughts and there are exact events, but there are auras of attitude. But if you're trying to get to the exactitude of things that you're trying to do in Harari, you, you never go across the border, either forward or back. What? Yeah, there are people who do that. There are people who look at their horoscope. Uh, 
Uh, and then they do solar returns. In, no, no, that's a different kind of dynamic <laughs> astrology. They do solar returns in once a month. They do lunar returns. And then once a day, they do daily diurnal charts, which means that they're doing something like 400 charts a day on a year on their own horoscope. These, these are people that are like the I Ching, people that can't go to the toilet without throwing the I Ching first. <laughs> I know people that do it, though. I know. Just a question. I thought the one degree was, uh, uh, was 26. Not the 25th. Maybe this was the 26th. Yeah, yeah, it has to be. Yeah. No, uh, yes, I think you're right. My memory is not too good. First person is the 26th. Yeah. Can you give like a nutshell background of the symptoms? Yeah. The idea is, is that there are two zodiacs. And that one is a solar zodiac and one is a lunar zodiac. And there is a whole system, the same way that the solar zodiac is based on the constellations through which the sun passes during a month's time, the uh, lunar zodiac is based on the asterism, the, the, the little tiny bunches of stars that the moon passes through within a month. And there are, there are 28 days. And so they are, they're called, uh, 28 lunar mansions. In, uh, in India, where they do a lot with it, they're called the nakshatras. Which probably Ela would be laughing at if she heard my, uh, uh heard my pronunciation of it. And so what you do to have the standard, you, because the moon is always changing, you start the solar and lunar zodiacs at exactly the same place. And so you start with the uh, first degree of Aries. And if you look every place where there is a green spot, that is a critical degree on, on this board. And so that those are the days that form the moon going once around the zodiac. Those are the spaces that they go through. I don't know the name of all of the asterisms, nor do I know the name names of all of the uh, uh, lunar mansions, according to the Indians. I was working with that a, a bunch at one time, but I just, you can't keep up with that. It's way, way more. So is it every 13 degrees? Every 13 degrees, yeah. 13 degrees is a critical degree when the moon is passing from one nakshatra into another, from one lunar mansion into another. Well, I was with you up to that point, maybe 13 degrees. My visualization is that you have, in the month, you have another, you have a mini zodiac in there. Yeah, it's, it's a superimposed zodiac. The same heavens, right. heavens only one is based on the, the lunar movement, and one is based on the solar movement. <laughs> and you're like, when the sun changes from one sign to another, you could call that a critical degree for the sun. When the moon passes from one lunar mansion to another, that's the critical degree of the moon. And they form a basic harmony. Because if the uh, new moon occurs on one critical degree, the full moon will occur at the next one opposite the next, uh, the next critical degree. I have a simple question. Yes. Okay. Since the answer is on there, is that, does it coincide with that? Yeah. Okay. These the, the, the triangles the are exaltation points. Yeah, and I think that's all there is. So they should be so yeah. Outer, yeah. Really the outer right. wheel is the sign. Oh, I see. These are Chaldean uh, decanates. Oh, these are these yeah. are Ptolemaic decanates. There are three different kinds of decanates. There are modern decanates, there are Chaldean decanates, and there are Ptolemaic decanates. And these are terms. No, these are, I'm sorry, the decanates are, Tol are, are Chaldean, and the terms are Ptolemaic. Yes, right, every 10 degrees. Uh, the uh, Egyptians especially used to, used to uh, the, uh, the, the terms 
are of various different sizes. I, I, as far as I can tell, they relate back to little clusters of stars also, and that they are just carried over into the oh, tropical zodiac. Yes, it does. That is part of the uh, part of the rhythm between the solar and the lunar year. Rulership, exaltation, fall, detriment. There's going to be a legend. There's, yeah, there's going to be a legend. I'm, I hope maybe this summer I'll get the planets and put the planets on here. So you can move the planets. The ruler is Aries, because the, well, the Mars red. Exalted mm -hmm. is the sun. Mm -hmm. I'm going to have a legend. It's going to be right on that mm -hmm. uh, thing on the wall there. Uh, there's, there's and then you're going to have... Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So that's, that's uh, is everybody ready to go on? <laughs> you know, I can't quite get my head around it. Mathematically, I can't visualize this. Mm -hmm. Oh, so give me an example. You got you. Let's just look at the moon and the cardinal sign. Yeah. Is it suppose that the moon at midnight in one day is uh, at the first degree of Aries, zero Aries. The next day, it will be at thirteen degrees, and when it's in that thirteenth degree. It is critical because it's changing into a new, into a new area of its manifestation. A new day. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's it's like saying when we talked about the days of the moon when we were talking about uh, it, when we had the uh, profile things when we talked about each of the 28 days being different from each other. That's what this is pointing to. It's saying like that it has a different uh, a different uh, phase quality each each day. Plus, this is critical also because it has to do with the harmonies of uh, new moons and full moons and what's called the cycle of stars. Okay. <laughs> All right. Looking at number CC. The dispositor of the sun gets up to seven points. Does everybody know the difference between a dispositor and a depositor? Can you go again? All right. <laughs> <laughs> All right. We may have to extend this next week. <laughs> oh, yeah, we're going to be doing this for several weeks. A depositor is the ruler of the cup of a house. Oh, uh, uh, all right. <laughs> uh. All right, is that clear? Oh, come on. <laughs> all right. Let's look at the, do you all, do you all have the blue chart with you? Yes. Okay. All right. In the blue chart, the depositor of the sun is Venus. Because Venus is in the 12th house and the ruler of the cusp of the 12th house is Venus. Got it. All right. 
a dispositor lose the planet All right, so in the J. Blue chart, the dispositor of the sun is Mercury. And we're, we're looking for the depositor and the dispositor of the sun. Not the depositor. The depositor is Venus and the dispositor is Mercury. Because the sun is, if you remember it this way, ah, uh, no, there are some cases where they are the same. This positor gives this position. So if that wasn't the Sun. Depositor <laughs> gives location. Now, what were you asking? I was going to say, if the sun wasn't, let's just say the sun wasn't in Mercury. Of, in Gemini, I mean. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, same thing. Sorry. Uh, let's say it was in Cancer, then the dispositor would, would be would be the moon. Okay. And, and we're saying that this, we're saying that this in CC we're saying that the sun is significant enough that uh, it uh, it its dispositor has has a little bit of influence. Yes, it gets a boost. All right. Add up to seven points for the dispositor of the most planets and the dispositor of the ruler of the ascendant. Uh-oh, I didn't do the ruler of the ascendant, did I? Oh, how could I do that? The dispositor of the ruler of the ascendant would be Mercury. So Mercury gets another seven points that aren't listed there. Yes. So, so I'll have to correct that by next Venus week. Has the most and planets. Venus disposits the most planets. She disposits Mars in Taurus and the Moon in Saturn in Libra. And what we're saying there is that because a planet gives its disposition to that many planets or adds its disposition, it's increased in strength. Well, that means that Venus is going to have an advantage in that because it will... It's, it's going to have a dispositional advantage, but not a depositional advantage. Usually, depositional advantages are just a little stronger. I got them close here in the system, but uh, usually they're... Uh, now we're breaking myths. Yeah. That is a, dep a depositional advantage. Well, the, fine the, the deposition has rules the cusp of the house. That the that that a planet is in. No, I meant as far. The advantage is because giving attitude is one thing, but opportunities, providing opportunities or denying opportunities, is more important than giving uh, a, a flavor of attitude. Okay. This is why uh, I'll finish up. This is why my claim is that in astrology, the houses are more important in everyday events than the signs. 
It's more important if you want to work with the practical things of someone's life to look at the houses in which a planet is located than to look at the sun. So I'm saying that as far as my experience goes, that position is stronger than this position. In my layman's terms, it would be a dispositor presents an attitude, yeah. whereas a deep uh, depositor or a deposition or what? Yeah. De a depositor. Depositor would uh, give opportunity. Yeah. yeah, it opens the door. It rules the cusp of the house and it opens or closes the door to whether you can use that house. If you think of each of the houses like a room within a mansion, sort of like the toilet is uh, the eighth house, <laughs> The, the way you get into it is through the front door. And the way you get through the front door is to have the key. And the, the uh, depositor, the planet that rules the cusp, is the key to the door. Or go around to the backyard and use the <laughs> That would be disposition. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> <I'm done. laughs> All right, everybody sees what we've done there. E, E, and F, F are optional. It brings in a whole different system of astrology. Yes, it, does. it brings in Chaldean revolutionary astrology, which ties everything to the grand cosmological cycles, but it's a, it's a thing. Each of the days of the week, anybody born after sunrise on Monday until sunrise on Tuesday, it has a planetary day that is ruled by the moon. The days do not begin at midnight and end at midnight. They begin at sunrise and end at sunrise. Say that, say that again. Well, just take the days of the week. Monday, <laughs> Monday is moon day. Sunday is sun's day. So everybody born from sunrise on Sunday until sunrise on Monday is born on the sun planetary day. And it, the sun would get bumped a little for that. Anybody born on Monday, from Monday at sunrise until Tuesday at sunrise, the moon would get bumped a little bit. Tuesday is Tyre's Tag, which is Mars's day. And it gets, uh, yeah. Tyre is the Norse Mars. Yeah. Yes. If you go into Span into like Mexico, they call it Dias Martes, the day of Mars. It's it's one of the only things where the pagan astrological system is completely in the modern Christian world. And Wednesday from sunrise until sunrise on Thursday is Mercury, after Wotan's Tag, Wetan's Tag. Uh, that would be Wednesday. Wotan is the North Mercury. Monday to Tuesday. <laughs> wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Monday to Tuesday is the moon. Yeah. Tuesday to Wednesday Mars. is Mars. Wednesday to Thursday is Mercury. Mm -hmm. okay. And Thursday is Tyre's, is a Taurus tag. And right. And Jupiter. And Friday is Friday's tag. Which is Venus's day, Saturn's day, and then we've done the week. Yeah, why? Uh, again, in Mexican they call it Dias uh, uh, Venus. And that is, that's for FF or for EE. That's for EE. E. Then, in order to get FF, uh, getting EE e is fairly easy. All you have to do is log on to the net, and uh, there's a perpetual calendar on the net. If you send me an email reminding me, I'll send you the URL of a perpetual calendar, and you can always tell what day of the week somebody was born on, and then you have to determine whether it was before or after sunrise, because you can get tricked by that, and uh, then you have the day of the week. Then you need a planetary hour book. 
I think I have one of the only ones left in the city. <laughs> no, simplified scientific astrology has one, and it's not quite as accurate as this. But it goes by the Chaldean order. Sun, Venus, Mercury, Moon, Saturn, Jupiter, Mars. And this is for what? This the is hour? if the first hour on Sunday is ruled by the sun. If you take and then take every hour after that ruled by another planet, first sun, then Venus, then Mercury, then Moon, then Saturn, then Jupiter, then Mars, it turns out that the first hour after sunrise on Monday is ruled by the moon. And then it goes around the same sequence again and then uh, after going through all of the planets several times, the first hour on Tuesday is ruled by Mars. And by first hour, you're talking about sunrise. Okay. Yeah, sunrise. Sunrise. Yeah. first hour after sunrise. Now comes the tricky part. <laughs> the hours are not 60 minutes long. <laughs> the hours are diurnal and nocturnal hours. The diurnal hours are one twelfth of the way from sunrise to sunset. And the nocturnal hours are one, one twelfth of the way from sunset to sunrise. Which means that in the summertime, the diurnal hours are going to be very long and the nocturnal hours are going to be very short. And that's why you need a table of planetary houses. This is actually the way ancient calendars were made. They had, well, like when, they, you know, when you read in the Bible about the 12th hour or something like that, they're not talking like our hours. They're talking about diurnal and nocturnal hours. But they're even at the equinox. And they, and they even break them in half. Because like when you read in the Bible about the, uh, yeah, the equinoxes, they're equal. When you read in the Bible about the four and twenty elders, they're talking about the rulers of each hour. And then some of the hours, are, you know, it gets into a really complicated system. I, I'd like to give a series of talks on it sometimes because it's a beautiful system of astrology. So can you get a Chaldean watch? <laughs> <laughs> no, you can get a Chaldean clock, though, if you know how to use it. There used to be the uh, Spillhouse space clock. And the Spillhouse space clock you could just about look at it and see uh, how how the hours were divided. So that only accounts for seven hours? Yes. But then you That's go right back and you start all over. You keep That's looping the through them. Yeah. You go Sun, Venus, Mercury, Moon, Saturn, Jupiter, Mars, Sun, Venus, Mercury, Moon. You just keep going perpetually like that. Didn't you say something once you talked about this before, that late at night on Saturday? Uh, <laughs> no. Uh, yeah, uh, a pass on that. Um, this is something you can test out for yourself. Literally, you can test this out. This, the knowing of the Sabbath, whether it's from the Jews or whether it's from the Gentiles, this is one of the most carefully kept things going back in history. But you can check it out for yourself. The sun shines brighter on Sunday. I don't know why it is. All you have to do is to be mildly sensitive to determine that the solar quality, yeah, I suppose if you're really sensitive, you can feel the quality of each day. I used to be, when I first started, right after I had the mystical experience, uh, it, well, I was so sensitive that I could tell you when it was changing from one planetary hour to another and which one it was changing from and which one it was changing to. At one time, I used to be able to be so sensitive that I could tell when the new moon came in, it would go boom, you know, you could feel it in, you could feel it exactly. If you get reasonably sensitive, which I don't think is a wise idea, <laughs> <laughs> not, not unless you have, unless you have the control and the love to do something with it, uh, it's a torture otherwise. Yeah, exactly. But th these are things that you, you can... <laughs> yeah. I have a question. All right. <laughs> okay, now that, that now that we have this basis, which is going to take a little while to sink in, but I got the gist of it, how do you determine... You look in the table of planetary hours. 
And that it's, tells you which is the strongest. It well, tells you how you give it points out of. Oh no! Oh no! No no! All right. We've, all right, let's let's continue on with what we're doing here. We want you know, if you really want to learn how to read a set of planetary hours, we'll take some time and set aside. But I don't think I think this is optional. Right. All right. <laughs> uh, I am going to ask a question. Um, you say it's optional. Where does the use come in? Where would the um, what would the advantage be? Um, and if it was that carefully tracked, there had to be yeah. some very valid yeah. use for it. Um, Max Heindel mentions that when he had to cross borders, like a Friday because the uh, border guards would be much more irascible on Tuesday. <laughs> yeah. I'm sure now you tell me when I fly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there are things, if you want to, uh, if you look, all of the religions, Christian, Jewish, whatever, all of the religions that uh, worship on Saturday tend to be more legalistic. All of the religions that uh, worship on Sunday tend to be singular, uh, meaning to say that there's a lot of one way, our way only things. The Muslims worship on Friday, and uh, huh? Oh yes, it's it's a very feminine society. It's a very feminine society. You don't find. You you look around and see how many uh, weightlifting uh, uh, Muslims you find. Not very many. The culture is very very soft. It's Tunisian in nature. Belly dancers. No. Belly dancers. So All what's, right. So what does Friday make them? Venus. But yes. I mean, you were talking about singular, and you were talking about yeah. Realistic. That's what I'm saying. That that this makes uh, the tendency very much for devotion for. For loving qualities. On Friday? Mm -hmm. Boy, did that get distorted. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Unfortunately, there are other things about Islam that are uh, very different. Mm -hmm. All right, let's look at GG. <laughs> GG. Oh, yes. That's why we're in class. Yes, there used to be one. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I have classes on Thursday. You get the best reception and the most open mindedness on Thursday. All right. GG is subtract up to 10 points for retrograde planets. Now you look, Jupiter has only five, uh, minus five taken away from it. Saturn. Uh, Saturn has only minus five and Neptune has minus six. If you look, Saturn is, uh, coming out of the retrograde because the sun has already passed the opposition. You give the stronger numbers in GG, the closer the planet is to the opposition or conjunction of the sun, conjunction with the internal planets, Venus and Mercury. So if the sun was in the 10th house, you'd give it a stronger... Um, no, if, if you look at Neptune, the sun is still building up to the opposition to Neptune. It's got to go all the way to Leo until it's opposite to Neptune. So it's building up. And so it is uh, stronger because it's on the wax. Whereas uh, the, sun, the sun is going to be perfectly opposite uh, Neptune when it's in Leo. Right now it's only in Gemini. So it's building up to the, the opposition of Neptune. You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. That part. So that's why it has a stronger uh, it has a stronger hit because it's building up. Whereas the sun opposite Saturn, the sun was opposite Saturn when it was back in Aries, and so it's pulling out of the retrograde. And before too long, within the, within a month, 
it will be out of retrograde. And so the strongest are at the exact opposite, where the retrograde is the strongest, and it's a little bit stronger building up than when it's pulling out. This is all basic astrology. This is this is stuff that's been taught for years and years. We're just putting a number on it. Yeah, I, I, I only will come in here two years. Like, so the retrograde <laughs> happens when the sun is. Is that what you're saying? The retrograde planet. That's right. The For the outer planets, the retrograde ha- the planet has to be opposite the sun. For the inner planets, the planet has to be conjoined to the sun, but on the same side of the uh, sun that the Earth is on. Thirty years, huh? I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> You've been studying this for 30 years. <laughs> 40. I'm a little bit behind. <laughs> 40 you're years. You're in retrograde. <laughs> <laughs> the Saturn is I don't know if I'm coming out of it either. No, okay, this is saying the retrograde. The for Neptune and Saturn to back off, they've got to be on the opposite side of the, of the zodiac from the sun. Yeah. And he, he, you said it was in Leo or something. I don't know what that has to do with Leo. Because, because Neptune is in Aquarius. When when the sun is uh, opposite, it will be in Leo. Exactly opposite. Oh 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 yeah, because the sun is moving much faster. So it's building up to the. Yeah. It's building up to the. And after the opposition, it it Neptune goes direct. No, uh, quite a while after the opposition, because because the sun is already past the opposition to Saturn. Yeah. And but it's 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 over. It's over a month past, it's over a month past the opposition to Saturn. I suppose you want a picture, huh? Yeah, yeah. I have one other <laughs> question. Uh, I'm sure. you move me. <laughs> <laughs> yes, <I'm. laughs> All right, let's take it. Does everybody got this on dispositions and de- uh, depositions? All right. All right, let's draw a picture. <laughs> I have a question about the moon's node, Richard. Yeah. Is it always retrograde? Yes. Well, it, it all depends on what time frame you're looking in. If you're looking in terms of uh, minutes uh, or hours, sometimes it goes forward a little bit. It all depends on where the moon is relative to the equator of the Earth. Most of the time, on the average, it's constant throughout the history. It's 3.1 to 4 degrees retrograde. But if you look in a good ephemeris, like the Rosicrucian ephemeris, it, they show that it varies, and sometimes it actually looks like it's going forward, and that's, that's when the Earth is righting itself uh, from the, uh, from the uh, gravitational pull on the equatorial belt. But I don't want to go into that. It's way too much. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Let's take a far out planet. Let's take Pluto. <laughs> And let's say that Pluto doesn't move. The sun is going around it. When it gets to a certain spot, well, let's, uh, let's do this that way. What happens? Let's put this. All right. That as the Earth goes around the sun. <laughs> The Earth is a little askew. <laughs> All right. The Earth is going around the sun. When it gets to a certain point, the sun, the, uh, Pluto looks like it's going retrograde. The, when, it's, when it's exactly opposite, when the sun is opposite, oh, I got a wrong picture here. There. Yeah. So, um, now, now, as the Earth gets over here, it looks like Pluto's going that way, while the Sun is going that way. And for each planet, there is a band for the number of days of the year that it is retrograde. So that any time that the Earth is in this area, the planet will be retrograde. And the height of the retrograde is right when it's exactly opposite the Sun. 
Now, I don't recall anymore, but I think the further out the planet, the wider this angle is, such that I think Neptune's is like that, and Uranus is, is like that. So Remember three years ago when all the planets were lined up in Taurus? Yeah. Right? Including the sun and the moon and everything? That's right. That's when it was on the opposite side of the, of the sun. Yeah. The Earth was on the opposite side, so everything was in first phase. Everything was about ready to kick off. That was Richard's favorite term during those years, first phase. Yeah. Now we're living in first phase. We know what that means. <laughs> yeah. All right. When Mercury is on the same side of the sun as the Earth, at the height of its retrograde, when it's retrograding the fastest, is when it's conjoined the sun. When it's over here, it's beginning. When it's <laughs> I don't know how to say it. When it, when it appears over here, it's beginning. That's because the Earth's movement this way relative, because of the planetary distances, and Mercury's movement this way, even though Mercury moves more degrees because of the distance, the angle between Mercury and the Sun appears to go backwards as, as you go. I, I don't want to draw the pictures okay. off because it's an enormously yeah. long thing. As a, I usually... But it's only for Mercury then? Or Mercury or Venus. Venus. Yeah. So well, what we're saying, all we're saying is that from the beginning of a retrograde to the uh, conjunction, it is building up to the highest degree of retrogradation, retrogradation until, and then from the conjunction until the retrograde is over, it is waning. So that's the same thing as the Earth being on one uh, side of the uh, opposition as the other. So that'll be... Well, at opposition and conjunction from our point of view, is that correct? Yeah. Do, do either of you guys have uh, Astrolog, a computer, and then yeah, yeah, Astrolog? You can see how, you can set it up so that you can see how Mercury retrograde works real easily. Uh, just uh, temporarily take all the other planets and and get rid of them or you know, check them off so that they do not show, and then move your move your uh, uh, planet forward or your uh, zodiac forward a day at a time until it goes retrograde, and you can start to see what happens and why it is. And what you notice is that it's all perspective of how the Earth looks out at what is behind the it's Mercury, what it see what it sees behind the Sun. Yeah. It's not even that it's and you see how it goes forward, and it's that Mercury is going that much faster in in the case of inward uh, than the other uh, than the. Uh, yeah. no, earth. That right. I see. That I. But it's it's an interesting. I mean, once you see it on the on the astro. Yeah, uh, yeah. I, new, every few years, I make a drawing, a scale drawing. I get into an argument with somebody, and I make a scale drawing. We did one the other few yeah, years. Yeah, and you were still. <laughs> no, I was right. <laughs> I was right. <laughs> All right. H H. <laughs> yeah, I remember that night. H H is a uh, sexual thing. In a male's chart, you always give somewhere around twenty to the sun because. Males are more responsive to the sun and less responsive to the moon. I suppose if you wanted to, you could take something away from the moon and Venus. Uh, I don't know. I've thought about that from time to time. You can experiment with it if it gives you something more accurate. And this is a fairly significant hunk. 20 for the sun is like a minor low orb aspect. And 10 for Mars is a pretty weak aspect, but it's giving, you're giving quite a bit. And then you just add everything up. And then you enter that total into, uh, it's, it's more than biological differences. It has to do with the inner bodies and how sensitive we are to them. 
And it has to do with what? That's right, because those testosterone and estrogen are all of the endocrines are expressions of vital body, and they are not expressions of the physical body. They they communicate with each other directly through the bloodstream. They do not use the nervous system. In fact, all the endocrines talk through the bloodstream. Mine are too. <laughs> <laughs> Harry's <laughs> females are a competition. When they're, when they're raging, let me know. <laughs> <laughs> now that 20, is that just an arbitrary? That's an arbitrary number. It's an arbitrary guesstimation number. It's like everything else in the whole system. It's up to you. You can change it as you see fit. Just yeah, look, at, look at a few hundred horoscopes and the, the, the fact is, is that men need women and they always marry the moon because the moon is latent in, in, in them whereas the sun is active. Certainly there's more heart disease and egoism in men than there is in women and there's more breast cancer and imaginative qualities in women that have to do with the moon. And Mars have the, has the testosterone, and women have their, uh, you know, <laughs> hormones. But and that's about the only one that I'm really not following. I'm just saying, as far as where the numbers come from. It's the only one I get. <laughs> <laughs> well, the sun and the moon are the same size in the sky. Yeah. Think of it that way. They cover each other. They cover yeah, each other I mean, so if, if and you're saying that every male chart, the sun is going to get an extra 20 points, and Mars is going to get an extra 10 points, just because it's a male. Oh, okay. That's that's that, right. but the, mas yeah, the masculine planets uh, are more strong in masculine human beings. Okay. And, and the sun is stronger. The reason the sun is stronger because it's active more throughout life, whereas Mars is usually only active early in life as far as the sexual uh, uh, differentiation is concerned. Okay, oh, so and like what, so what would it mean, what would it be for a female? Equal 20 and 10? 20 and 10, yeah. So we're going to see that when we get to the other charts. Moon and Venus. Then. Yeah. Okay, that's what I'm going to do. All right. And what do you do with these photos? You total them up and you enter them in Two. column 15. Column 15. Column 15. Now, oh, that doesn't look right. Why doesn't it? You have the sun. Oh, they, they, oh, oh, I put them in the wrong columns, didn't I? 16, huh? 15, and 16. Yeah, yeah. yeah I, I inverted 16 and 15. I'll have to straighten that out. There's two errors that I made. Okay. We'll just go like that. Draw arrows. Yeah. Okay. The numbers that are in column 16 should be in column 15. Okay, so you have to change Mercury's total. And I have to change Mercury's total. We may run into some other errors. Now, yes. Holy cow. 29. No, but we're, that's that's for the next that's table. This one up here. Oh, okay. Yeah, I got 15 that's and 16. Yeah, all right. See, if you, if you change those columns, then the numbers are aligned. Yeah. All right, we have quite a bit to go through. <laughs> you want to uh, skip until next time and do the uh, ABC the next time? I don't think we'll get through very far. I don't think we'll get there. get there tonight, and let's let's do that next time. It's fine. Yeah, because it is a lot to take in. It is a lot to take in all at once, and it's a lot of familiarization. And I'll I'll, I'll correct it by next time, and uh, uh, I'll go over the other numbers too. Okay. Yeah. We just did planet sign, right? The planet house we have to do next well, time. Yeah. yeah, that's that's what we're going to do. Did we just talk about it? <laughs> <laughs> well, we haven't done this part yet. Yeah. Which is, uh, we haven't done planet house control. We did the bottom part. We haven't done this Right. Oh, what Does anybody have any questions about anything that we've done? <laughs> Do you think we'll retain any of this? Yes. yes. I think you will retain this. I think this is exceedingly important. If Even if you don't do the estimation, 
just go through all of the steps and look at these things because most people don't look at all the factors in the horoscope. And if you want to do something, you know, you want, if you want to have a thorough understanding, you want to look at all of the factors. How important do you believe the depositor and dispositor to be personally? Uh, I think that if there's, if I were to change anything about them, I would probably give them greater strength than I now give them. I think they are important. Especially when you're coming to empty houses. More of the ancient astrology was done by empty houses than by full houses, by indirect influences than by direct influences. And a full house beats everyone's house. And if you look at William Lilly, for example, and you don't read his horary astrology, but if you read her, his, his horoscopy, where he works with natal horoscopes, uh, the genophilical astrology, he does it almost all by rulerships of houses and rulerships of signs. Uh, so astrology used to be all done that way. It's only in, in the last oh, couple hundred years that you work directly with the, with the uh, planets. Well, that's why I'm stuck. I'm used to... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're remembering from a few hundred years ago. Yeah. So again, don't get panicked by all of this because it's, you're, you're being familiarized with a lot of things you may not have ever considered before. They're all simple things that have been in astrology for a long time. Uh, a large number of them go all the way back to Babylon. The rulerships go all the way back to India. The exaltations and things like that go back to Babylon. Some of the other things, some of the modern usages of these things go back to Rome. And they were brought into astrology by people trying to pick winners in chariot races. <laughs> <laughs> yes, if you read, <laughs> <laughs> if you read a history of astrology and when what things came in and how they were verified and how they were used, it's just amazing. Like if you read about early Egyptian astrology, it's like a totally different language altogether. Let's tackle that next week. <laughs> <laughs> Anytime so you want to tackle <laughs> Ross, <laughs> just let me know. <laughs> so all those exaltations and all that, that observation? Yeah. Uh, I don't know. It depends on what you mean by observational. For some uh, people, clairvoyance is like well, he's, he's talking about, you know, like way back in Vedic. Yeah, the rulerships. The rulerships go back to Vedic things. His <laughs> value. <laughs> she had speculations on where the outer planets were by rulership, exaltation, and esoteric religion, and I think she hit it right on the money. She said her whole generation was defined by the fact that we put Pluto and Leo as esoteric rulership at the sun, or, or Pluto, sorry. Esoterically ruled in Leo, we decided that was going to be the way it was. Which is also playing out right before our eyes, right? Because they do do that. So um, the boomers, you know. Speak for yourself. Jerry has a question. <laughs> I, I have a question that kind of went to. Well, you'll get it, Jerry. I'm a Gemini. I just have Mary's rising. Oh. Everybody's here. I felt like it was a good question. I could feel it all over here. <laughs> what were you guys talking about? <laughs> <laughs> Exaltation. Exaltation. Yeah. yeah. So that is the question. I know how it is. better than the other shit. I think what needs to be defined is the word exaltation. Yes. Because... I agree wholeheartedly. Okay. okay. I agree. I think that... <laughs> I I would rather see it rather than exaltation. I would like to see it as specialtation or something like that. Specialtation. Okay. Yes, yeah, that a, got a special quality comes out. Well, uh, let's just use the sun. Yeah. The mm -hmm. sun would be exalted in Aries, correct? Yes. No. Yes. 
Yes. And it would be exalted right at that degree where the triangle is. Yeah, that's like okay. okay. glass. Okay. So the question, I mean, <laughs> the, I would think that the influence of the sun would be greater or greatest there simply because you you notice that a person, or I believe, I think, or I, I, I'm thinking that a person is more likely, for example, at least on a physical point of view, to have red hair with the sun in Aries than they are uh, with a, the other. In the, you don't believe so? No. I think Mars in the East has to do with red hair more than anything yeah. else, irrespective <laughs> of race. There are friends of mine and they had a baby with Mars, and it was the sun Mars and Leo in the first house, and so red hair was different. Yeah. That's why it's so... But, yeah, but, I see what you're saying. The, I, I'll agree with you that there's a lot of vitality, but the sun is not the most sun-like when it's in Aries. No. The sun is most sun-like, and it's the most powerful planet when it's in Leo. Uh, Things warm up when it's in Aries, but it's hot when it's in Leo. So it shows its greatest power then. But it, it, bla light. it turns everything tan. <laughs> Uh, are all your triangles um, exaltations? Yes. Just, just the red ones. Just the, the they're all all the triangles. Are okay, I figured I figured out the thirteen degrees of your little squares. What what are yeah, your the the exaltations? Yeah. I go back to observations from ancient times. I think clairvoyant, but I don't know. Not a pattern necessarily. No, not a pattern. There is a pattern to when a planet is exalted, but we'd have to go into zodiology to cover that, and I don't know that I want to do that. Jupiter yeah. exalted in Cancer. <laughs> <laughs> the fifteenth degree is it? It has to do with unary cycles and when a planet is coming back home. All planets are in exaltation when they're back home or coming back home uh, to their place of primary rulership. And this is the same sign? I'm no, the same. no there's, a, there's, there's, a, there's some kind of a geometric progression that I don't know anything about going from one geometric figure to another to another to another. So it's just something that you need to memorize. Something you need to memorize. Why a particular degree? Like the That's sun's like right there in the middle, but then you've got Can uh, Taurus and Capricorn near the cusp. Yes. I don't know what to say on that. Those are observations that are apparently made by ancient seers. I wouldn't put a whole lot of stock in it. You know, like you don't see it in the estimation system here. And Those would be the critical degrees of it. Uh, not critical, maybe that's the wrong word. Yeah. Because it would actually be an entire planet. When it is most especially exalted Strong. or specialized, yeah. So you, you you don't consider the exaltation to be as strong as rulership. Very much no. important. Oh, I think it's important. I give I give it two thirds of the strength of rulership in in, in in the estimation. Why can we go through? Yeah, can we go through the signs like the exaltation? One of the exaltation degrees, just out of curiosity. Mm -hmm. Like the moon, which is retrograde. All right. Okay. I'll try to give you the special quality that comes out when the sun is exalted in Aries is vitality. Not power, but vitality. It's vigor. Everything comes back to life. The special quality that comes with the moon exalted in Taurus is clannishness. It holds together a clan-like quality. It's not reflective and it's not emotional like it is in Cancer, which is its basic nature, but the adhesive quality or the cohesive quality is the exaltation of the moon in uh, in, in, yeah, all right. Where is the next exaltation? Yeah, Mercury yeah. is exalted in Virgo. What about yes. cancer? cancer? Oh, oh yes. The exaltation of Jupiter is in Cancer is preservation. That Jupiter is the preservator of everything. It's the big guy that tries to hold everything together. It's not positive like it is in Sagittarius. And it's not universalistic like it is in Pisces, but what it does 
is it preserves things, it's the preserver of the good. Neptune exalted in Cancer. What is Neptune is also exalted in Cancer. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay, hold on. What, what, what else is in Neptune? Uh, Neptune and Jupiter are both exalted in Cancer. Well, I thought you didn't say Jupiter is in Gemini. No, no, no. Nothing's no, nothing in Gemini. Oh, nothing. <laughs> and uh, the exaltation quality of Neptune is like solution. Like solution? Yes. Like uh, when something is dissolved in water, the whole essence goes through. If you have one drop, you have the entire ocean. That kind of quality. Homeopathy. Yeah. Call it homeopathy. Mercury is rules and is exalted in Virgo. And the special quality that comes out there is that Mercury is most itself as a um, servant in Virgo. Servant? Yes. Servant. Fifteen degree servant? Now let's see. One, <coughs> two, three, four, five, that's ten. Eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, nine. Yeah. I don't know how the ancients used it. I just put it in there as, as a conversation piece. Now I've got more conversation than I want. <laughs> okay. So, so we should both have been ruled from Venus. All right. Saturn. Saturn is exalted. Saturn. Yes. Of course. Yes. That makes 21 sense. 21 degrees. Everything. Okay. Yes. And the special quality that comes out there is justice. Okay. justice. Pinpoint justice. Is that 21 or 22 degrees? I there are not exact degrees. Let's see. Well, you've got them there somewhere. 10, 20, <laughs> 21, yeah. 21 degrees. Yeah. Yeah. There are then Capricorn is Mars. Uh Capricorn Mars is it's the only time that Mars is under control. Instead of just fighting, Mars becomes a, a field marshal. And it becomes like mechanical perfection. The Uranus is exalted in Scorpio, but there is no exact degree for it. Did we miss that? Well, you there's, no, the, there's, no, there's no exact degree for it. Um, and the quality... Uh, in Scorpio. Yes. And the quality of Uranus and Scorpio is like ionization. You know, like diluted uh, sulfuric acid is stronger than concentrated sulfuric acid because of the free ionization in the water. But, but it, it's not like the complete freedom of I free understand. ions in uh, in the ionosphere, which is like Aquarius is like it's like the ionization that occurs in water. Oh. Neptune has its uh, there's white there, right? You believe Pluto is exalted in Pisces in the 27th degree? No, I believe no. that um, Pluto is exalted in Gemini. Why? Because the um, Mercury is the only planet that would have any parlance with Pluto at all in any mythology that you would look at. Uh, that Merc Mercury, Mercury and Pluto were the, uh, Mercury's, the, if there was, uh, somebody had to tell Pluto to do something or ask him to do something coming from Zeus or whatever, it always had to be Mercury because Mercury is the only one that Pluto would talk to. Sucker written on the forehead. <laughs> <laughs> no. Uh, there, there are, there are <laughs> other, <laughs> there is, like there is Iris who was a messenger god. And but she wouldn't have anything to do with Pluto. She was not nice to ladies. Good luck trying to read that. So uh, the uh, exaltation of Pluto is uh, Gemini, and that would mean that the fall is in Sagittarius, and we're certainly uh, witnessing that now. Is the fall always opposite the, of where the exaltation Yes, yes. So oh, good, that the, saves a lot of writing. It's almost that way for the detriment, too? No, yes. The detriment is opposite rulership. Um, rulership. Yeah, detriment is opposite rulership. Okay. No, it is, no, and uh, right now, all of the uh, relig religious reactionary tendencies that are in the world with all religions 
Chert certainly is like a Pluto being in fall. It's sort of like a, a special kind of negativity, I think because of the divine attitude about it. Pluto is not really a positive planet. It's in his fall right now. So the and it's there for a long time. Sometimes as much as 21 years, depending on where it is. It has a very eccentric orbit. It's short. It's short. It's short. It's short. It's short. Yeah. Not as short as it was for Scorpio, though. It's like halfway. Really? So but you said the fall is always in opposition to yeah. the Yeah. The average is 21 years. So the and when it went through Scorpio, it was, it was under the 14. Moon would be what? Right. Right. No, I don't think so. Yeah. What's that? Oh, that would be it. Pluto rules Scorpio, but it has its um, fall of the moon. Well, the fall of the moon is in Scorpio, yes. So it's actually the fall of Cancer is Scorpio. Fall of Cancer. So some people, some have two falls. Fall into like Saturn. Yeah, no, there, there are only, there, yeah, there are dual rulerships, but there are not dual falls, uh, exaltations or falls. That's why there's a, the slight ones are empty. Yes, that's right. And that's Jupiter's right. fall, fall is in, <laughs> and Jupiter's fall is in Capricorn. That's correct. So, okay. There's yeah. a special quality to each of the falls also. A special weakness. Like the fall of Neptune in um, in uh, Capricorn is like the crumbly quality of desalination, and the quality of Jupiter in fall in, fall in Capricorn is like uh, being pigeonholed. Not only is the scope held down, but it's the uh, there are definite boundaries. Where's, where's Venus? Venus's fall? Exaltation. Venus is exalted in Pisces. Oh, the special quality of Venus in exaltation in Pisces is sacrifice. And there's a word that is, there's a phrase that is in the English language that describes Venus in Pisces very well. Oh, it's a little yellow one. Right? Yep. And that is the Rose never smells as sweet as when it's crushed. And that is what, uh, is fatal love affairs with Venus in, in Pisces because they're always trying to sacrifice to save somebody. A little bit of martyrism. Yeah. And now then, so we've got the exaltation. Venus in Virgo does not, it loses all of its cohesiveness. Yes, it's a really often a sign of gossip. <laughs> a terrible gossip. What is? Venus and Virgo. Fall. And, and then what's the, de what's the definition of a detriment there? Detriment is its weakest place, so it's most out of character. Venus likes love and harmony, like in, in uh, Taurus, it can't stand all of the discordancy and the sexuality of Scorpio. Nor can, nor can it, it the Venus in Libra is peace, whereas it doesn't like the warlike nature of uh, Aries at all. It's a gambler, but better. Is there something exalted in Aries? Jupiter, Sagittarius, no. Gemini. Yeah. No. That's interesting. So, I thought I had a All right, I've had enough for tonight. Well, thank you. We were yeah. just getting started. <laughs> <laughs> I think you had an interesting concept of the esoteric rulership uh, is just decided by each generation that they pick how to find it and they decide where they want it. He wanted class on Thursday. <laughs>